welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of the upcoming Glitch Tricks RPG, the... Come, and coming us to, a, to us from Baby Bard Games, the one and only Daniel Lacutis. How are you doing today, man? Doing great. Doing great. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. Good times. Yep. Thank you for com thank you for coming on. So it's a bit of a tradition around here to open with the humble beginnings, as it were, the origin story. With that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. For role-playing games in general, what got me into them as a whole? Yeah, your intro to it. Uh, my first intro, you know, back in the days when you were a kid, not so much with the RPGs, but you start with, you know, Candyland, Life, all those fun ones. But the main thing that brought me into TTRPGs was Rifts from Palladium Books. Um, ended up playing that a lot with a group of people and then moved on and started DMing games myself with a few friends. And that's what really got me into it. I had only at that point played Dungeons and Dragons like once or twice with my cousin and a few of his friends, but nothing extensive that I actually learned. And that was around the time of third, I think at the time. And after that, I eventually got into playing 5e with a group through Twitch and the community that I have on there. And that was a lot of fun. And I'm still playing off and on to this day alongside with where I started making Glitrix about four years ago. Get it off and on and on my own time when I could aside from work. Mm -hmm. So it is, in it is interesting that you brought up rifts, given <laughs> some of the comments I've made about rifts in this in this um, system, in this in this ch in this channel, I should say. Um, most mostly mostly the messes that can happen with that system. Yeah, it. I heavily modified it and dumbed it down at the time when I was playing with my friends and DMing it myself. It was. It had a lot. <laughs> That's one way to put it. Between martial arts, different types of magic, and different ways you had to enable to be able to do that magic, and then, yeah. Well, that that and um, not the best navigation, even for the time. Yeah. That's it's the navigation thing that's part of why Rifts has been my whipping boy for so many years. And. Glitrix takes a little bit of inspiration from it, not too heavy on it. It's more of an inspiration on D&D, &D and from what I've been told, some minor systems from Call of Cthulhu, but nothing extensive. Mm. Though, as, as I understand it, the core mechanic is D20-based. Yes. Yes, it is a D20 game. Now the the way you des the way you described it is in the in the um, bullet points is a c cybernetic planet. So do you, do you consider it to be um, do you consider it to 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 be a cyberpunk setting? Do you consider it to be high fantasy? Do you consider it to be a hybrid? It is most definitely a hybrid. Mm -hmm. The world itself, aside from the general skin that's placed over it, is basically fantasy dragons what would look like magic but it's more based on the systems that the planet has created in within itself and it's my main phrase that i use is picture a world that looks like something from witcher and then the rgb lords of razor sponsored that planet so a lot of rgb lights uh, the planet itself looks like it's pulsing with lights that are ley lines going around the entire world, splitting off, powering different sections and different uh, biomes, just giving it a lit up look. Mm -hmm. 
and this this also applies to the fact that you ha you have um you have char you have characters being de being determined by OSs in a sense. So I'd like to yes. get into that. Um, sure. I mean, where would you like me to start? Just make a list, or would you like me to? How would you like me um, to go about that? So the way the way I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong. OS is loosely, sim loosely the equivalent of what would be classes or archetypes in other games. Correct. Yes. Uh, so I, I suppose the I suppose the first place to start on that on that is is it a case where it's a class where you're getting certain abilities at dif at different thresholds, levels, whatnot, or is it? a more freeform archetype where it's a starting package. It is more like what you would see in a typical MMO like game where you get certain abilities at certain levels that empower you a little bit more, give you something more out of your basket to use. Mm -hmm. Much yeah. like, let's say, the Breacher, which is the Ranger class of the game itself long distance though it does have a specialization not specialization let's say a passive which in this i'm calling subroutines because a lot of the terminology i use in the glitrix is going to be kind of tech based for the most part but the breacher has a passive ability at their first level called gun fu or gives them the option to basically be john wick mm -hmm. you can use a short a small pistol and a or two pistols, or maybe even a single-handed weapon with a pistol at close range without losing benefit of the chance to hit because you can't use long-range weapons up close without having a diminishing uh, chance to hit. Mm -hmm. And with that in with that in mind, uh, when it comes when it comes to e when it comes to each of the core stats muscle mobility mind brilliance personality and tech um, when I saw that character sheet that you were building it carried the it carried the idea that there's two that um there's two mo there's two um modifiers when it comes to it yeah um, each stat has well basically as it is weapons themselves are separated into one of those stat categories that you get better bonuses off those weapons if your stat the number on your stat is higher with that weapon category that makes sense mm -hmm. so if uh, like a we if you have a long sword it's a muscle weapon so if your muscle's higher you're going to be better with said muscle weapon you're going to be able to have a better chance to hit and do more damage with that weapon if your stat is higher. But if your stat's lower, you're not really going to want to use that weapon. Say if you're using muscle weapons, but there's a brilliance weapon, you're not going to want to use that because you're not probably going to be as good at it because you're probably not building your brilliance into it. Now, is there a weapon type that is associated with at least, with at least one of the stats? You know, you're, yes. you're not having one or two stats be the god stats when it comes to combat? No. They all have their benefits regardless of what you pick. There are the primary stats for each OS that you're going to want to use, mm -hmm. but you don't have to, but you're probably going to want to just for damage sake and making your class the best it can be, though you have the complete option of not doing so. On top of the fact you can multi-class, multi-OS, mm -hmm at your level so you could put five levels into one os and then do another five levels into another one and get all up to level five in each one if you wanted to yeah and but as far as the stats go themselves um i apologize i lost my train of thought going off on that tangent no wor no worries uh oh. so i i believe the so good shifting back to os's for a bit i'd like to yeah. go go through just some of the names that were in that were in the build that you had sent me and kind of get a feel for what their equivalents might be for in other um in, in other fantasy games or just in other games in general just get a yeah just a fair style. comparison yeah um starting with um android 
Yeah, a lot of the names uh, that I can't, or a few of the names I came up with are kind of just play on words of text based along with the class itself. So Android, kind of self, kind of apparent, it's a druid based class. They gain the ability to modify their body to become creatures or beasts of the world. Uh, they are min they do have a minimal use that they can ch change into that. Every a system kind of used from D and D in general, which is a soft reset or a short rest or a hard reset, which is a long rest. Mm -hmm. uh, you already mentioned breacher, so I'll skip that one. Yeah, that's your ranger. Um, convoker. Convoker is a kind of use and uses the nature and wind elements of the world and is a summoner base so with the convoker you're able to summon a permanent companion of your choice of your make there is a basic table that is added in on the on the class sheet mm -hmm. the os sheet for that so you don't have to make your own but you can if you want to that's up to discretion of the developer which is the gm in this game uh but basically you get a permanent pet at level one as a convoker mm -hmm. to help you in combat The Fragmentor. Fragmentor, basic, run-of-the-mill, more or less paladin. They use lumen element, which is light, the lumen element to burn their enemies, get rid of viral infections of the world, and such to that. Such to that. But they do, at a higher level, gain a bonus in damage of a certain element based on the administrator which is the deities of this world they're the administrators that basically run the different systems that keep the world itself going and running properly mm -hmm. and basically you go through that list you can choose one of the administrators that are involved and there's an element linked to them and you gain bonus damage with that specific element that you take up as your administrator mm -hmm. um mal warlock um, is as the last half of the word, the Warlock uh, uses viral damage with the viral element to infect and poison the enemies. When they have a successful hit, their bread and butter, they are they add a basically a dot of damage over time onto the creature that can only be applied to each creature once. But once it's applied for, I believe it's one or two turns, it's been a while since I read the uh, list, but it, every one to two turns, it they will take like one d four damage, and then as they level up, it gets a little bit stronger to increase with the damage as levels go up. Mm -hmm. um, Neuromancer. Neuromancer is a more close to a necromancer. They use a lot of, uh, I believe, pulse element. Uh, which is like an energy or nature and viral I believe to use for their damaging attacks but they do have the ability to summon a companion as well they do have a companion ability but it has to be off of a recently deleted creature or a creature recently defeated that can uh, be re that can be resurrected as a combatant for you and at higher levels you do gain the ability to get larger creatures because there's a max of a size creature that you can do it first but eventually you gain the ability to basically resurrect larger creatures but they only last a short period of time mm -hmm. uh, overclocker overclocker closest to that would be a monk they're insanely fast they are based on the basic armor class system that I'm using for combat in this. They have a very high avoidance. They get the mobility is their focus dump stat that basically increases your avoidance mainly. But mm -hmm. they get abilities that increase your avoidance so they're harder to hit and they get a l more attacks than every other class in the game. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Fisher. With a P. Yeah. Fisher, P-H-I-I, -I, for uh, phishing emails. They are the rogue of 
this universe. Uh, basically, they are able to coat their weapons with a poison or a coating, as they're called in their uh, in their sheet, that gives them certain triggering effects when they do an attack with their weapons. One, they're able to coat it in a pulse element, I believe, that when they throw it, it if it hits, it also splits off more of those, the item you threw, and in energy, and hits the target as well for more damage. Mm -hmm. But their main bread and butter is their coatings that they get, that they can apply to their weapons. Yep. Um, speaker. Speaker is our lovable, and at the same time, probably hated at some times, bards. They're one of the think the only one that's based on personality right now which personality doesn't have any big bonus stats there it's basically a stat that's meant for talking your way out of situations it's your charisma stat more or less and what the bar the speaker has is a ability called a playlist where the different playlists will give a consistent buff to your party within a certain foot or certain range damage to enemies or less damage in general. A huge damage buff that breaks after a couple triggers of it. Mm -hmm. um, split Breaker. Split Breaker, the th closest thing I can say would be a Berserker class of some kind. As, they're, as they get higher level, they gain the ability to increase their damage exponentially. By their health being lower so when they hit like 75% mark of their health they get a damage bonus at 50% they get it a larger damage bonus and if they're at 25% they get an even larger damage bonus mm -hmm. but they don't get those they don't unlock those until a certain level at each point and then in some cases they do have an ability where they can instant drop their health to have that damage buff but they're also risking getting put down too so um, Terminator. Terminator, giant two-hand wielding monstrosities. Um, unlike, oh, back to the Spitbreaker real quick. They are able to dual wield weapons. That is their bread and butter. And they are able to dual wield even two-handed weapons. Mm -hmm. So that is their special thing is if they want, they can dual wield any kind of weapon in general. Yeah. And then now back on the Terminator, they only single-handed dual wield a two-hander. Mm -hmm but they gain a damage buff based on their muscle stat. So they didn't get increased damage the higher their muscle stat is, and then as levels progress higher, that bonus becomes bigger per certain amount of your muscle. Yeah. Uh, thermalist. Thermalist is the all-around elementalist or mage sorcerer. The run-of-the-mill glass cannon. Low health, lots of... Lots of uh, SP, which is the mana pool in this, and it's more akin to just playing a standard RPG game where you cast a spell, takes so much of your MP to use. Um, but they control four elements, and they are free, able to free swap between them, you, given it uses an action at first, or a bonus uh, secondary action, where they can do it during their turn, but they gain a bonus based on whatever element they are shifted into at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, transducer. Transducer, the closest, is a priest or a cleric. They're more of the holy light type with healing ability. They have a lot of healing capability along with, uh, I think, lumen and pulse abilities. And they are really there to make sure the team stays alive or able to support and also they have one ability that gives them where they can inject some power into a ally to regenerate some of their mana pool mm -hmm. their sp yeah um vpn vpn sword and board vanguard whatever you want to call them they're the knights that can go around take all the damage they have ability an ability to uh, taunt an enemy to make sure the enemy attacks them for at least a turn or two. They have lots of health, 
they're low on the SP scale, but they have a lot of abilities to dampen the damage that they take. Mm -hmm. Now, speak, speaking of that, with each of the OSs that I, that I saw here, they lean towards a particular um, stat as their primary one. Is there would there still be is it, is it a case where it's advisable to you to um to pick one that it that represents the highest stat or is it a is it a case where um you, where other st where other stats can still have their place in a given OS's design? Aside from personality, which is more or less if you just want to be able to talk yourself out of situations, every stat does have a bonus that is viable for any. Real, realistically any of the OS's themselves like tech you gain the ability to hack electronics like that's what the non-combat rules like what you would do for acrobatics in D&D &D or insight that sort of thing uh, tech has the ability to raise the amount of SP you have every level that you gain you get more SP per level so you can do more abilities the mind you get damage dampening and I think it also increases your turn in combat. I need to bring that up really yeah. quick. My apologies. And I couldn't help but notice that you ha that when it comes to the when it comes to the features of each, you refer to them as hacks. Yes, uh, because I originally did have a separation between hacks and what I originally called programs. But I modified programs to just be what I call the non-combat actions, like acrobatics, insight, in, uh, investigation, that sort of thing. And I just kind of lumped them all up to be whatever ability is extra, whether it be range or melee, is called a hack. It's just uh, added on attack or different attack from basic, instead of doing basic. Yeah. And... When it comes to when it comes to die rolling, do you still have it that nat twenties and nat ones would be automatic successes and automatic failures, respectively? See, this is this is where some people I might lose a couple people because no, one in twenty is not a crit or a fail. That's the one system I put in place. Is some people just don't roll great. I'm being one of them. So it might be a little bit biased that I'm adding this system in, but what I did is when you roll a natural 1 or 20, based on lore that I've, I'm establishing, the world isn't 100%. So if you technically critically fail or critically succeed with a 1 or a 20, you roll off of a what would be a lot like a ma wild magic table. And it's only on atta attacks, not so much on the non-combat rolls. Only on attacks, if you roll a 1 and 20, you roll off the, ma the glitch table. And the glitch table triggers a random effect from the 1 or 20. And it doesn't matter what you roll, you can use whatever you roll on the percentage, whether it's a 1 or a 20. I made sure of that. Hmm. But a random effect that adds some chaos into the mix, as aside from just, oh, I got a 20, that's a lot of damage, which is great but I feel like chaos can be a lot of fun. And in my test sessions, it's added some interesting moments, to say the least. Yeah, I can, I can certainly get that. Oh. And I, I, could see why, I could see why some people might have an issue with that. I don't. Oh. Because I, also because I never, <laughs> I never assumed this, this kind of thing. But with with that in with that in mind when it comes to advancement it looks like you have a, a almost a bullet point like des, like design when it comes to xp yeah and that's one thing that i'm still kind of working on it'll be more fleshed out once uh, i'm getting to release and all that but i do have a setup experience points whereas if you are unsuccessful on an attack once per turn you gain an xp based off your figuring of failure you gain an experience which is a system i got from i think it's called blades in the dark or no the apocalypse system mm -hmm. it's the system that monster of the week uses and uh other games that are like that whereas if you fail a role you get experience for it mm -hmm. and i thought that was a really interesting system though if the developer decided they want to go off a milestone system that's perfectly all right as well 
which certainly makes sense. Certainly makes sense. Um, and the way I the way, is it a case where every where every few, every few levels the threshold is going to go up by five by five? You already in the document you had sent me. Um, it starts at fifteen for the first five levels, then goes up to twenty per for the for the next five. Is that the pattern all the way through um twentieth? Uh, see, that's. Uh, I only am doing levels 1 to 10, at least at this time, because doing up, like, max level is going to be 10. Mm -hmm. So, unless I'm misunderstanding the question. Yeah, it's just the the way the way it, you had written only level 1 through 10 in the document made me assume that you were going to go further. No, uh, actually, all the classes as of this moment and the game itself, like the mechanics... Are essentially done, but I want to do fine tuning and make the map, make the world, and all that other fun stuff. But as far as the systems go, they are applied the way I want them to be applied. The only thing I need to modify, as far as the experience, is how many experience points per level. I just put a basic rounded number for now, mm -hmm. and I'm going to modify those later. But it is only going to be one through ten. And I'm going to make the higher levels take a little bit longer to get to. But um, the way I'm going to try and balance is because obviously people might try and spam certain non-combat actions to try and get that experience. But what I'm going to try and do is you can only have up to five points per level, which I haven't put into the document yet. Five points per level that you can get off of non-combat actions and failing. And then the rest has to at least be combat. Which certainly, certainly, um, it may, it certainly makes sense. I mean, I've seen I've seen some cases where that um, granting of XP happens when you um, when you botch, but there's multiple ways to go about it. Yeah. Uh, now, with with that said, on the adversary end of the spectrum um i'm assuming you're going to be making a, a bestiary are you go are you going to be making a um system so that G gms and i'm just using that out of habit can can um put in their own monsters or their, or their own encounters yeah i i have a template that i work off myself that i'll be adding into the book mm -hmm. uh and then I'll add that in. So if people want to make their own monsters, they can. The monsters I'm making, I don't have a ton of them, and that's why I didn't put them into the book directly yet, because I'm kind of remodifying how they are working, because I am adding in a scaling system. So not only can you use the monsters for higher levels and such, ra rather than just using them for the basic level that they are and having that challenge rating that D&D &D does. It's basically how many people are in the party, add this amount of health per level, and add this much health per level. Mm. And so they can just add and they can put in whatever monsters they want. And I also have grouping, like usually there's this monster solo, or usually there's two or three of these in packs and such like that. Now, when it comes when it comes to um, armor, like the the meat, the equipment to defend to defend oneself, um, is that is that going to be tied to to cer to certain core stats, or is or is it going to be a case of different types of um, armor? See, and uh, one thing that I uh, will, that I put in the book and i know i that's a 90 pages so i know you didn't have <laughs> i don't expect you to go through and read and memorize everything so uh there is no armor in glitterix and i make that a point in the book uh what you will get eventually are things called mods that you can basically install onto yourself that will give you bonuses in certain ways or add to your avoidance, which avoidance is the armor class stat, and this basically can be flavored as a parry or a dodge or just straight the person missed in some way. But avoidance is the main stat. There is no actual armor. All right, I I can get I can get that. 
No. Which I guess you could consider mods a form of armor, but it has a different use case rather than just buffing you up to not get hit. It's more changing your spells or maybe giving you a little bit more points or a higher chance to hit. Yeah. And in that re in that regard, how does that tie into the processing speed die? Okay, the processing speed die, because I'm setting a base avoidance of 8, I may lower it to 7, I'm still kind of in decision about that, but there will be the base of 7 or 8, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll get a avoidance bonus off of your mobility based on how high that is, and then Brilliance has a set die based on your stat that you will use to roll at the top of every turn in combat. And once you do that, you add that number into your avoidance as a sense of how fast did you process the information flying at your face. Because mm -hmm. computers don't run at the same speed at all times. They might get bogged down. Yeah, they might get bogged down or they might have to deal with um, other processes. Yeah, pretty much. So it's it's a weird system because originally this combat system has changed three or four times since I conceived it four years ago yeah. since I started putting the game together. And do you consider this combat system to the combat system that you have for Glitrix to be a um, theater of the mind or do you see it leaning more towards grid combat? It could be both. Like it, There is a very grid-based way you could do it, but if you have a good image of the mind, really you can kind of play anything with a narrative. And everything's listed for beat or what a cone is, uh, how far attacks go. You can you could do a grid 100%, but it's not against you know doing it just full out off the top of your head either. I can I can def I can definitely get behind that. And it I get would it be fair of me to say and I'm just get I, this is just a feeling that I end up getting going through some of the material that at some point you had a, you had an equivalent of a dedicated spell system that was separate but over time integrated it into the OS systems. I had a spell. I'm trying to. I'm trying to figure out what you mean by that. Um, I apologize. Just that it was there. Was there a was there a spell like design? Was there a more spell like design at at an early iteration that? Oh um, oh. Evolved in, would evolve into the way hacks work in the current form. Yeah. See, originally the system I had in place was more, very much grid based and more, I guess, Warhammer-esque, but there was a very much more complicated system I was putting into place where your tech would actually give you back SP if you held in action that turn, so you could regenerate SP while in combat, so you could do spells, but you had a lot less, lot less SP, and you would have to make the decision, do I stop and not do a basic attack and charge my SP? I had a whole, like, regeneration system with SP, and then the health points. I could see how that could create a bit of a turtling issue. Yeah, it would be a turtling issue, but the thing was, is it was a combination of your health pool and mana pool. So your health pool was your mana pool as well. You had a very low actual DP, and you basically had a shield that drained as you used tax or got hit. So it was very punishing, but you were able to regenerate some of that if you sacrificed an action. And I felt that that was a little too complicated. I may add it in later as an option in a like a second edition or something as an option for if people wanted to go hardcore and beat their heads against a wall with numbers. They could do that. Yeah. But I felt this was a better system to go for an easier way for now. Yeah, the way you just the way you describe it, it reminds me of that position thing that the that the five E um. Dark Souls project by Steamforged had, which um, ended up creating more problems than it solved. <laughs> yeah, I I 
had that for a good year where I was doing it with a system like that. And I, I kept looking. I'm like, you know, this is looking more and more complicated as I keep going over everything. Let's just try and flip this to a base. You have to rest to get your mana back or your SP back. Mm -hmm. And that'll just be a lot simpler. People won't have to worry. Oh, did I regenerate SP this turn? Oh, let me put that back on there. Oh, I forgot to do that. Okay. Well, I guess I'll do that next turn. Yeah, and whenever you're dealing with a limited resource, there's the temptation to play conservative with that resource, which is how you get the rainy day paradox. Yeah. Also known as 99 mega elixirs. <laughs> but, oh, get old FF7. Well, it's 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 nothing it's nothing new to to um games in general. I just use that as an example because of this in this infamous um comic pa panel that had that had somebody up against the final boss, and he's like, "What? I can't use one of my ninety-nine mega elixirs. What if I need him for later?" <laughs> yeah, that's good. I like that. He says against the final boss of the campaign. Nope, I'll need that later in my epilogue. <laughs> or, in, or in like, or in like New Game Plus or so, or something like that. Something close to that. So, getting back, getting back to the bestiary, there, one of the more infamous things with monster design in something like Five E is um, challenge rating. You know, and the the big reason why that's a bit, been a bit contentious is an argument can be made that the whole this is what the this is what the levels the average level should be for a um part for a party of four against this particular monster. Uh, which is relying on too many assumptions. With that in with that in mind, do you when it comes to the levels when it comes to scaling the adversaries that you have as well, especially with that custom thing, are you using it based on a level and overall tier? I know you have boss encount encounters mentioned in the uh, material sent. Yeah, there will be boss level creatures. Mainly, they'll just be. They'll have their the difference between a boss and a regular will more than likely be the fact that there will be less static status effect ability on them, and they'll also have different move sets that may be a much like a lair action or dungeon action, something that they can do to the arena or a different ability in general that's more overpowering than a standard enemy would have most of those bosses will be either like a level five which will be for the lower level players or level 10 for the max level players yeah since you've made a few allusions to mmos would they be akin to like raid bosses yes that would be the idea behind it and it to be real the whole glitrix world did start as an MMO game type project in my head until it I evolved it into it's a planet that the Earth, that Earth sent off in the far far future that they sent off to with it's so much to explain though <laughs> basically they created a storage device for the human mind and were able to create a light, a light source that could store data, and they just basically put the human race on a data block and sent them into space with the a bunch of nanites that had a bunch of programs and systems in place, which are the administrators, to create this world upon reaching a suitable location for the world to be built. Mm -hmm. And then once the world was built, it started creating a uh, android like bodies with the nanites to put these what i call nano souls which are basically souls of human beings that are data bound into this light source into the bodies that become people mm -hmm. and then the world itself creates creatures and other things to fight or adventure which wasn't the original plan of what the project was supposed to be but the programmers that had control had different plans. Mm -hmm. I can I can certainly get that. 
Now, with that in, with that said, what are you shooting for as far as a page count for the book? My guess, because it's going to change a lot, because it's currently on Google Docs, mm -hmm. as I said. So the writing and the way it's set up, I'm guessing the player's handbook would probably be 150 or less, and the developer's guide, the DM book, will probably be 200 to 250, but pro no more than that. Mm -hmm. That's a guess, so, and I can't actually say be until I get it into a actual scripture program where I'm actually laying stuff out and getting it set up the way I want it. Which is fair. And I will certainly look forward to seeing how that develops. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Oh, I, I greatly appreciate it. And if you have any other questions afterwards or in DM, feel free to hit me up. Uh, yeah, I'm free. I'll be happy to answer if you have any critiques. I'm good with that, too. Um, and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> hey, I'm all for that. I'll go grab a beer now. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, Stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>